Hi, this is Ken Johnson for another episode of SecCast. In this tutorial, we discuss and demonstrate access control vulnerabilities. We've briefly touched on the subject in both our mapping and enumeration tutorial, as well as our client-side control tutorial. Today, we will cover a few variations of access control issues. The first topic we will cover is forceful browsing. This is the simplest variation of an access control issue. This usually means we can request a resource that requires a user to have elevated privileges, doing so as an unprivileged user, and having the privileged content returned to us. This indicates a total lack of access control over the resource. To demonstrate, we will request the admin dashboard as a non-administrative user, and the application returns the content to us indicating a total lack of protection. The next variation of this problem occurs when JavaScript is used to control access to a privileged resource. This does occur in production systems and the reasoning behind it differs, but this is typically a result of an inexperienced or untrained developer creating code to solve an access control problem. The basic idea is that JavaScript is used to redirect the browser to another location, allowing the application to act as though proper access control has been developed. In reality, this is a highly ineffective and dangerous way to control user access. You can see in our code that if a user is not an admin, we will include JavaScript code that redirects the user to their dashboard. Once executed in the user's browser, the user will be immediately redirected, giving the appearance of proper access control. The first thing we do is request the administrative dashboard as a non-administrative user. We will review the raw request as well as the raw response in our intercepting proxy. We can see the full response is returned in a 200 or OK HTTP message, but that there is JS or JavaScript that redirects our browser. Next, we will navigate to our proxy options and check the option to remove all JavaScript. This time, when we request the admin dashboard, we aren't redirected, but we don't see any of the content we should be seeing. This is most likely due to our removal of all JavaScript. Instead, we should remove only the JavaScript responsible for redirecting our browser. We will do so by unchecking the Remove All JS option and adding a Match and Replace entry. We will match document.location and replace it with an empty string, effectively breaking only that JavaScript code. Essentially, when the response body is passed through our proxy, our proxy will strip the JavaScript code responsible for redirection before it hits our browser and executes. Next, we will attempt to request the admin dashboard again, and this time, the response is rendered providing us with full administrative access. Last variation I would like to discuss is 302 redirection. This is an edge case where some frameworks such as .NET allow you to redirect a user, such as when a user requests a resource for which they do not have permissions. But if a developer provides an additional option to the redirect function, the entire contents of the page are still rendered. Again, you will see a 302 HTTP response code and your browser will be redirected. But if you review the response body, in this case, you will see the entire body of the page. Once you've discovered this vulnerability, switch the 302 response code while the response is stuck in your proxy to an HTTP 200 response code. The page will be rendered normally and you will not be redirected. Identifier-based access controls relates to the use of a user ID parameter when requesting resources. If the user supplied identifier is used to control access rather than the application generated session, an attacker can exploit the application in some way. As an example, here you can see we request our account details page. In the URL, there is a numeric identifier. We will rotate this value to see if A, this is indeed a user ID value and B, if it is used to control access. After rotating the value and re-requesting the page with an assumed user ID of 3, nothing changes. This indicates that the page may not be vulnerable. Let's change our email address and attempt to update our profile. 
we will proxy this request to check for the presence of user controllable parameters that might control access. As suspected, we can see a user ID parameter. Let's change this value to 1 since we can safely assume the first user ever created has the most privileges on this application. Let's not forget this is a RESTful endpoint, meaning that parts of the URL could be used as identifiers as well. Let's change this from 5 to 1. If everything worked, we've just changed the administrator's email address. Next, we will log out of the application and attempt a password reset request. Let's enter the suspected new email address of the administrative account. Now we want to check our inbox. It appears we do have a reset link. We follow the link and create a new password. Let's try logging in with these new credentials. As you can see, we do have administrative access. This is because the application leverages parameters we supplied to make access control decisions. Parameter-based access control is similar to identifier-based access control, except that it could be a string, a Boolean value, or some other type of identifier used to control access. In any case, the vulnerability and exploitation are basically the same. The first thing we will do is attempt to request a resource known to exist only to administrators. In this instance, an analytics page. A request to this page ends with a redirection to our dashboard. However, if we request this resource again, only this time with the parameter admin equals true, you can see that the analytics page is provided to us. Let's analyze the code at the server level to see why. Here we see an administrative filter used for access control, but only if the admin param method returns true. You can see our analytics endpoint or action, and it does have the administrative filter applied to it. But again, this filter will only execute if the admin param method returns a true value. If the method returns false, the administrative filter will not be activated and no further access control inspection would take place. We take a look at the admin param method and can see that it will return true and trigger the administrative filter if the parameter admin is not true or present. In essence, the administrative filter will never actually be triggered so long as a user supplies an admin equals true parameter and value. File name obfuscation occurs when developers attempt to create resources that are seemingly unguessable or in other words, resources or files that are obfuscated or unlinked. The assumption being that access controls do not need to be applied to these resources due to the fact no one would guess or find them. Navigating to our work info page, we can see that we have the ability to download our work information. We will click this link, catch the request in our proxy, and review the file name as well as copy the file name. Now, this is a real scenario that I've seen another consultant come across while performing an assessment. In essence, while the file name changed, the extension never did. In the end, it turned out to be a ROT13 encoding technique. ROT13 encoding, if you are unfamiliar with it, is an encoding technique that takes the letter in the alphabet and rotates it 13 places. In other words, A becomes N, B becomes O, etc. We suspect ROT13 is used here, so we will leverage Ruby code to exploit this possible weakness. Before we do that though, we want to see what is contained within this document. It appears to contain very sensitive data such as our SSN or social security number and date of birth, DOB. We want to see what Mike's salary looks like as well as steal his identity. Let's fire up our Ruby interpreter. So we'll rotate our file name 13 positions so that it is normalized. It appears to be our email address plus a PDF extension. Let's change that email address to Mike's and rotate the value 13 times. We will copy that value and click download again. In our proxy, we change the default file name to our new file name in the hopes we capture Mike's details. The application does not complain and does indeed send us a file. When we open it up, we see that we have succeeded in capturing Mike's details. Sorry, Mike. Now, ROT13 is just one type of encoding. Be aware that there are many types of encoding. You should analyze each resource to ensure that custom or weak encoding is not being used. 
Additionally, developers should not rely solely on obfuscation, but rather tried and true access control methods. Non-UI based controls is a term I use for requests that aren't necessarily triggered directly through the web interface or aren't directly accessible via a web interface, but should be inspected for access control issues. For example, here we will try and request the administrative dashboard from an unprivileged account. We are redirected properly and are unable to access this panel. Now, because we are performing an assessment, we have an administrative account available to us. We will authenticate with this account. Once authenticated, we will navigate to our administrative dashboard and begin editing our data, all while our proxy is recording the requests and responses that are being sent behind the scenes. We will change our last name to test and submit the request. Next, we will navigate to the proxy history tab and highlight all requests to administrative functionality. Additionally, we will create a comment annotating that these are administrative functions. Next, we will log out of the application and authenticate as a lower privileged account user. We will look through our proxy history to find the request responsible for updating a user's profile. You can see this is an AJAX request by the X requested with headers value of XML HTTP request. Let's right click on this request and send it to repeater. We now need to replace this request session cookie with our unprivileged users cookie. If proper access control is applied, the application will detect that a non-administrative user attempted to make this request. We copy and paste the cookie into repeater and change the last name parameter to another test. If this works, and when we authenticate as the administrative user, we will see our last name was updated by an unprivileged account to another test. And you can see that we were successful. Other ways this manifests is through clients that call an API, such as with mobile devices or thick client applications. Don't assume that just because the UI that triggers execution of these requests has proper access controls in place, that all endpoints or resources have proper access control in place. To recap, we've talked about a few ways access control issues can be discovered and exploited. Forceful browsing, identifier-based access controls, parameter-based access controls, and resource obfuscation. I'm Ken Johnson. This has been another episode of SecCast. Thanks for watching.